Good to be with you. We're here today to talk about the new IPCC report and what it means to us and to the world. Uh, my name is Mark Anderson. I am the founding CEO of Strategic News Service and of Pattern Computer. And I'm delighted to be here with Ryan Wright and with Peter Carter. I'm a retired medically trained doctor and I have a background in environmental health policy development, which um, uh, has had me involved in uh, the issue of all issues of all time, which of course is global climate change for a great many years. Thank you, and Brian? I'm Brian Wright. I'm a retired founder director in the natural medicine industry, and I continue work for an educational institute integrating the discovery of our true essential nature and psychology with awareness of the existential crisis. And that it is, that it is. Uh, so I think we'll start with Peter Carter uh, first. And Peter, um, I think framing this is helpful. And so if you could give a general audience a quick view of what is the IPCC, what is group one uh, in the IPCC, and what is this report about? So the IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's the recognized authoritative voice on uh, global climate change. And it has been doing periodic assessments of climate change every few years. And uh, this is the sixth assessment. So that reflects the amount of time that has gone by. And we're still in a situation of catastrophically dangerous greenhouse gas pollution. So um, the IPCC is actually a mixture of uh, climate scientists and um, uh, government representatives that sit on the IPCC panel. That's why the IPCC tends to be somewhat conservative. There are three reports. Working group one is the report on the science, the assessment on the science. The other two reports won't be out until next year. That's very relevant because the next big United Nations climate conference is coming up at the um, 31st of October up to the 12th of November. There are a number of, um, of reports within this report. And what we'll be talking about is the summary for policymakers called the SPM. And um, that's a um, shorter version of the full, very long comprehensive science report. Uh, IPCC did a great job on their news release of the uh, Working Group Room report. And there's also uh, headline statements. So those two are, are very good resources for the public because the IPCC does the headline statements so that they're not in uh, you know, scientific language and yet they uh, touch on the most important points of the report. Right. Is there a particular aspect of this particular report which you found unnerving or different or, you know, unique or uh, of, of particular mention? There is a fundamentally uh, big difference. This report is um, a definite report. Its conclusions are definite. Um, this report is the first one. It's taken a heck of a long time to uh, state that uh, global climate change is unequivocally caused by human activities. Right. We, uh, we can all be empathetic with those on the committee who are trying to be careful not to overstate or to misstate what they know and to, to, to use appropriate confidence levels and so on. The messaging uh, has been unhelpful often. And I think it, it, that the conservative nature of the report out can provide a haven for those who either didn't believe or didn't want to believe that this was actually a crisis. Does that make sense to you? The conservatism of, of reports uh, before this one, and to some extent, including this one, has given the impression that we have plenty of time before 2050 to make the enormous changes that are required Yes. And this is actually serving the interests of the fossil fuel industry, yes. who obviously want to keep their, their income going for as long as possible. And in fact, it has influenced the way that the IEA, the International Energy Agency, has laid out their plans for the future. If, if there's one thing that people need to learn from this report, it's this, and it's a statement 
from the 9th of August news release. And it says this, the report finds unless there are immediate, rapid and large scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, limiting the warming to close to 1.5 degrees C or even two degrees C will be beyond reach. So yeah, as you, um, as you point out, so rightly we are right out of time, Brian. Um, but there was always the proviso or the, the caveat that um, if nothing is done quickly, we will have more problems. I think the big difference with this report is that this is more quantified and stated with more certainty. Although there is the continuing language of uh, statistics, all these phrases that come from statistical analysis, for policymakers and um, people who are not as au fait with statistics and uh, the way that these probabilities are expressed, it does make it more difficult to understand the, the very stark situation that we're in and the certainty that with which we have to act now. This report is very much more forthright, uh, but we have quite a long history really of conservative reports that are perhaps running scared of the non-believers and unsurprisingly after four years of, of Trump disbelief in climate change there has been a, a tendency to to be careful to state things um, in a, a less than certain way and I'm very pleased that now we're getting much more certainty in the reports. I'd like to be a bit of a troublemaker at this point. I was doing this show a week ago or so with Peter Wadhams, who is a great guy from Cambridge. Uh, we came to a point where, uh, in my background, I work in patterns. I don't, I don't work in theory. I work in patterns. So I'm very good at pattern recognition. And I've done this in science and physics. I, and I have a company that does this with computers. So I'm pretty, pretty well aware of how, what the power is in that. And it's a very different way of looking at nature than to say, Here's a theory in physics, or here's a theory in economics, and so on. And what I asked Peter Wadhams was, is it possible that these various areas of concern and phenomena not, are, are not only threats alone, but that they can gang up together and, and interoperate in some way which was not foreseen by the committee? And he said, yes. He said, look at California, and look at Sicily, or St. Sardinia, and so forth. And then um, I said, okay, so Peter, what is the nearest term time frame when that kind of mega event might happen? And he said, five years. Now, five years is a number that everybody could get their mind around, I think. Uh, they, they're all going to still be alive in their minds probably five years from now. So I believe he's right. And I think that we're going to see mega events where fires become larger fires. Uh, they create their own weather. The weather creates climate itself. And you start getting into these these uh, very nonlinear situations, which were not foreseen. It seems to me that nothing like that's being covered in the report. Is that fair? Well, we have met such mega events right now today. Yes, we and do. we've had them from a few years from the research. Um, for example, we've lost the Amazon rainforest. It's a very hard thing to say. Um, it has, the Amazon has tipped. It is no longer a carbon sink buffering and soaking up some of our CO2 emissions, it has now started to emit CO2 emissions. And that is very, very clear from the uh, satellite images. One of the things that I like to do, because it's pretty easy for me to recognize, is to uh, look at the satellite images, which, uh, which are now very, very, very precise and very definite. And the Amazon is, is pouring out CO2. The other uh, mega event is that the Arctic has also switched that was recognized first by the NOAA in 2016. They spent a couple of years on uh, reviewing all of the research. And in 2019, they published that the Arctic has definitely tipped and is now a source of greenhouse gas emissions. The Arctic has been uh, emitting methane for many years because of thawing permafrost, but also warming subarctic wetlands. When the wetlands are warmed up, they emit more methane, which is what they naturally do. Uh, the uh, permafrost, though, is emitting all three of our main greenhouse gases. It's emitting methane, much more carbon dioxide than anybody anticipated. And that was just discovered by the research 
five years ago, but it's also emitting the third and extremely powerful greenhouse gas, which is nitrous oxide. So that is a absolute definite mega event because we are, of course, going to lose all the Arctic sea ice that will all be replaced instead of reflecting solar energy away from the Arctic and the Northern Hemisphere. It's going to switch to an open water, which will be absorbing water. And actually this year, um, at least a month ago, the Arctic uh, sea ice was um, matching the record sea ice low in 2012. Um, that's a bigger event even by itself, because when the uh, Arctic sea ice is tracking lower than the average, then we're losing the cooling already. So we're losing cooling for months. Now, the ultimate mega event, which is also from the Arctic, which is what you allude to, Mark, which is combination, okay? So the combination of losing Arctic sea ice reflection, losing uh, subarctic snow reflection, getting more methane from the wetlands, emitting more permafrost carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide, from uh, thawing permafrost. And then of course, Peter is very interested in uh, subsea Arctic methane hydrate. Um, that's showing very small emissions, but uh, right now there's been a huge change in the amount of methane being emitted from the Arctic. There is a vast amount of methane this year for the first time being emitted. And it's coming from a huge area of Siberia where the uh, deepest permafrost is we're talking about a thousand miles of permafrost and uh, people have probably seen the raging fires over the uh, Siberian Arctic, unprecedented fires. And um, uh, they are thawing, they're burning and thawing the, the peatland even below the forest. That is going deep. So that is thawing the permafrost even faster. So that fire effect is, is, is a huge event, which really hadn't been anticipated until a couple of years ago. Uh, have you seen the, the pictures of, of the, the craters formed by methane bombs? When the permafrost starts melting, the, the methane vaporizes underneath, and there's a, an enormous explosion that leaves a crater 100 feet across and 100 feet deep. And um, 17 of these have been uh, recorded in an area of Siberia um, and indicate very much that the storage of methane under the permafrost in the tundra is reaching a critical stage and it's exploding out. So, Mark, I'd like to come back to, to your original question, which was about pattern recognition. Um, this is something that I think that the IPCC is really not good at um, because they talk about the, uh, the carbon cycle and the main carbon sinks. The main carbon sinks are the oceans, the forests and vegetation, and the soils, including peats and tundra. The uh, carbon sinks are responsible for withdrawing 59% historically, of the carbon emissions every year. So we're, we're utterly dependent on the carbon sinks for keeping our concentration of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases at a, a reasonably bearable level. As soon as the carbon sinks uh, stop their functioning, we're in real trouble, especially if we're still emitting carbon dioxide at the rate that we are now. The IPCC scientists do not report on the likelihood of these carbon sinks failing, but they do note that they, they may fail. The evidence seems to me to be clear that the ecosystems of the oceans, which are acidifying and heating, the acidity has gone up by 30%, and the heating of the oceans is way uh, ahead of the heating of the atmosphere. But the tundra, as we know, is, is melting and the, uh, the forests are burning. Uh, as Peter said, the Amazon has turned into a net emitter of carbon dioxide. So the carbon sinks are failing. And if they catastrophically failed, we would be in trouble because uh, the carbon budget would be gone in that instant. 
that the, the carbon sinks fail. So uh, the pattern that we have to recognize here is that it's not just a, a geophysical problem of climate change. It involves the whole ecosystem, the whole biosphere, and the geophysical uh, changes, and the human contribution to, to the problem. All of these things are making a whole system change very quickly. And uh, we notice the very fast change in the jet stream um, that seemed to surprise everyone with heat domes and, and temperatures going up to nearly 50 degrees centigrade um, in northern Canada and 35 in Siberia, nearly 50 in Sicily the other day. This is a, a very fast and uh, unexpected change, really, and very unpredictable. The jet stream can go snaking off in all kinds of directions. The IPCC in the past has always um, inferred that the carbon sinks were going to be just fine, and the scientific assessments of the carbon sinks until very recently said that they were going to be fine. No, all of that has changed with this working group one report. They are both going to fail land first, and also they say that the ocean carbon sink is going to fail. That's huge. That's, That's huge. huge. Yeah. The, the, the selection of 1.5 or 2.0, which is very heavily featured, I think, in this report, um, degree centigrade, as targets and meaningful thresholds, when we're, as we're discussing right now, there are much more meaningful thresholds than that. And uh, I, I think it's misleading to have the entire world focused on, is it 1.5 or 2.0? Is that a 0.5? Is that a 0.25? Personally, I think that's not of good service to people. I agree. Um, uh, global average surface warming um, uh, is not at all helpful for the public to understand the catastrophic global heating situation that we're in. The fact is that the uh, 1992 UN Climate Change Convention, the metric that it requires for climate safety is, and was quite properly, atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. Mm -hmm. So really, those are the numbers that we need. Um, uh, they're readily available, and they're all accelerating. Um, global average temperature uh, sort of uh, takes away from the public from that. I, you're quite right. I totally agree. Um, the best single metric actually is ocean heat, ocean heat content. So, um, yeah, the IPCC has done us a disservice on giving us over and over and over these 1.5 to, you know, 2.5, et cetera. But it really, what really matters is how much energy is being absorbed by the ocean or by the land or by the atmosphere. That, it's not that it, the temperature is just the result of that in any given locality. So... Um, we should at least be talking from a scientific perspective about energy instead of about temperature, but we're not doing that. There's been a big shocking recent paper from NASA and NOAA on energy in which they, they've done something pretty brilliant. They've combined and reviewed the satellite data on land energy, and they've used the, um, the NOAA uh, buoys, which are distributed all around the world's oceans, and they've checked uh, energy from the heat point of view, which is very reliable, as I say. So what they found was that the energy imbalance has doubled in just the past 14 there years. There you go. Now that's interesting. That's terrible. Right? That's terrifying. And it's yeah. important. Yeah. It's a much clearer picture than saying we went from 1.5 to 1.6 or whatever. You know, totally. The, the point is here really that we're trying to persuade our leaders and our uh, policymakers to actually make an enormous, enormous, uh, unbelievable change in the whole way that we live and produce our energy and, and deal with the, the stewardship of a planet that uh, hardly any of them recognize is, is their responsibility. And we're talking about 1.5 as if it's um, a safe haven. The politicians uh, that I'm aware of have uh, very little idea of, of the implications of temperature rising to 1.5 or 2 or 4 or whatever it is. Uh, in fact, I remember um, the, the Trump um, quote that 4 degrees would be just fine. 
Um, so a uh, my, my question is, how, how do you reach the uh, policymakers with something, some concept that will really get over to them that we have to make this enormous change in the way that we live and we produce energy and keep our civilization going in enough time to avoid a, a real yeah. absolute catastrophe. It is, Brian, is there some way, if we were tracking human impact as a metric, instead of 1.5, 1.6 degrees of temperature, at least the politicians would take it more seriously because they have voters, you know, I mean, or, or they eat food. There would be some social impact that they might be able to relate to much more clearly than seawater rise of one millimeter per, you know, that who cares? Well, so, you know, we have, we have lost the Amazon. Yeah, right? I, I mean, the Amazon rainforest. That well, if ever there was a metric that the policymakers should pay attention to on. The other great jewel of planet Earth, right, is the Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier yeah. Reef is gone. We've lost it. It's been lost by our politicians and policymakers continuing to support the fossil fuel industry. They just bailed out the fossil fuel industry with a massive economic renewal in which uh, over 50% of the money they doled out went to the fossil fuel industry. So they got their enormous metrics. Well, let's not forget that, and, and please correct me if you don't see this the same way, but Bolsonaro, the head of Brazil, campaigned for president by saying he would burn the Amazon. Right. So it's not a matter of reaching him. <laughs> With that information, he already has that information. Uh, we have to express these things in some way which the people of Brazil would say this has to come to an end tomorrow morning. I, don't I know saw a report this morning that a survey had revealed that people in developed countries were more concerned to improve the climate change situation than diverting that attention to any other project. Wow, so, Brian, that's, that is so interesting. I'll tell you why that's so interesting to me. I have watched the Gallup polls done every couple of years on climate concern. The countries in South America have always been way up there. So I hadn't heard of what you're saying, but that, that is really important because it confirms that. Like 70% 70, 70 or more, the South American countries, the people are very concerned about climate change. <laughs> to convert the, uh, the political system into something that isn't uh, a slave to uh, the economics of fossil fuel is, seems to be the, uh, the big barrier to progress here. The other things that I noticed uh, recently was that the legal agreements for um, extending oil exploration in the North Sea are still in operation. And if the government uh, withdrew those licenses, they would be liable to prosecution. And I, I don't know how many millions of dollars or pounds compensation. So this is not only a question of changing people's minds, it's also a question of law and political power and money. That's right. Well, you've hit on, you've hit on the really big barrier that probably few people are aware of there, Brian. Um, uh, and that is the um, ability that has been given, uh, the power that has been given to corporations to, in effect, sue governments, not only for loss of current projects, if the governments decide to apply the nation's own environmental or public health protection. Um, the corporations now have been given power under the free trade agreements, under the World Trade Organization, to sue those governments for decades of supposed profits ahead. So that is a, that's probably the single biggest barrier, as well as corruption, of course. Governments are still subsidizing the fossil fuel industry. Mm. And I mean every government. Um, uh, China's the biggest, but all of our governments are continuing to this year to subsidize the fossil fuel industries. Now, that's the crime of all time. Governments doing that today in the light of this report in which at 1.5 degrees C, it's going to be a disastrous world. I mean, the 1.5 degrees C IPCC report in 2018 made that very clear and got the attention of the media and people 
we are committed now due to the prevarication of these governments to a truly disastrous world. And we are gonna go over 1.5 degrees C. This so report gonna... also makes that very clear. We're gonna go over that. So um, uh, government subsidizing fossil fuels, unprecedented evil in my view. I mean, right. if you've got any sort of ethical moral judgment about what's going on here. You brought something up, which I wanna to touch on a little harder and that is China. So um, in the Paris Accord, as you know, they, ca they came to Paris to wreck the accord, it worked pretty well. Um, they've made no, not even an, an attempt to, to set any new goals until 2030, I believe. Uh, then they'll start talking. We'll see what they say when they get there. Uh, they're building, I think they were building a coal plant a day. Now they're building, they've slowed down to one a week. That's, that's plenty. Um, even if the rest of the world stopped everything right now, their emissions growth rate is disastrous and i don't see any interest on china's part on xi jinping's part to play along with the rest of the world on anything you know it was ridiculous motivated by the fact we were in the trump united states area but the idea that china um was or would could be a world leader in climate change is absolutely ridiculous China's emissions are, are double what the uh, emissions of the United States are. I mean, they're way higher than anybody else's. And totally, we are going to continue increasing our emissions to 2030 at the very least. Now, today we have over 400 coal plants being constructed and in the later stages of planning. Now, of course, most of those are um, in China or financed by China in oh, really? other regions of the world. The, this is a planet killing strategy and policy that all the governments have. We can't give these guys a pass. That's what I'm trying to say. No, 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 no. <laughs> what, what if, this is the dream, what if the leaders of the world actually were forced, spoon fed, forced to accept that we have a crisis today and that their response would have to be the follow, something like the following. For the next five years, all you're going to do is save the ship. No more talk about sea level rise. No more talk about 1.5. Just get at it. It is the so, only solution. I can't see it happening as a proposal that's made to governments and they sit down and say, okay, we're going to do that. Yeah, right. Um, it has to come from the people, I think, of, of the world. It has to come from the whole humanity to recognize that what's in front of us all is an absolute disaster in which we may not survive as a species. We may be Absolutely. Extinct. extinction would be forever. Yeah. We would never have any hu more human beings on this planet. That's very important. And, and that's much more meaningful, I think, Brian, than the stuff that's in the report. So you, you don't have to believe in the Gaia hypothesis to say, oh, the, the cause of the trouble are human species, is our human species, and guess, guess how it's gonna go away. Given our current rate of recognition and reaction to the problem, it's gonna go away by getting rid of us. We will kill ourselves. And then the planet will be just fine. That's I mean, true. it doesn't have to be genius to see this work out, right? It's, the math is pretty straightforward. So uh, maybe people would re respond to that instead of to this idea of 1.6 or 1.7. Yeah, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I couldn't agree with you more, Mark. Um, the, the only solution is for people to, uh, I mean, we're communicating the dire emergency now. And Brian is absolutely right. I mean, I presented at conferences with all the data accelerating, say, look, my conclusion here is we're trending rapidly to a collapse of the biosphere, which means the end of everything, right? Certainly the, the, the end of us. Um, so we need people to mobilize, to ride up. And um, I don't see much of that yet. Because the only thing that will solve this, and it has to happen like yesterday, is, as you say, for governments to quit fighting each other, right, to unite over this emergency of emergencies of, of, of all time in all of human history. And um, they're going to do it. The question is, they have, the thing is, they have to do it now.
If they don't do it now, it's way too late. That's for sure. Mm. So what would it require of the people of the planet, on, let's say online, to respond to their leaders as a group to a particular document, for instance, it might not be the IPCC report number six. It might be something that you guys write. But whatever it is, imagine a, a, a one pager that says something like what we're talking about, backed up by a video like this video. It's a manifesto for the survival of the human race and most life on Earth. And there's nothing unusual or alarming about that because our United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, bless him, has already said that over and over. Uh, we do have the world scientists warning for humanity, um, uh, and, and they have done a number of published papers. And, and the one that became famous, of course, was the world scientists warning of a climate emergency. But one of the things that I, I've spent my life doing is working in a, a school that is based on the realization that all humanity is one. It's a unified humanity and that it's one because we are all basically the same. We're all human with an eternal side to us and a side which is trying to deal with all the problems of, of living and the problems of the planet. But that basic similarity, sameness between us is something that has to be recognized. And when it is, I think you get uh, the unity between different groups who are all working in the same direction, uh, but working at the moment, working somewhat separately. Um, we do need something that pulls us all together and gives us one voice in order to make this change. Right. The, the time is right because yeah. of, the, of the alarming, definite, this IPCC report, all of the extreme weather events it now says definitely with every increment of global warming, every one of those is going to increase. We're going to have more heat waves. We're going to have more floods, more forest fires, more reduction in soil moisture, they say, which is more droughts. So um, we got the backup on, on this scientific paper without any question. But yeah, lay language, sensible language, intelligent language, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think also things will really hit home when there, when uh, famine or food insecurity hits the developed nations. And I, I wonder how long that's going to be before it, it starts happening on the U.S. West Coast. I mean, California yeah, I is yeah. really getting dried out like a crisp. Water tables yeah, going mean, there, there, there's, ma there's mandatory regulations issued by California, right? Yep. Um, yep. Uh, for water. Um, yep. But the impression had been given, including by the IPCC assessments, that the global north was going to ride out climate change, at least for the end of the century. And, and it would be the global south, the poor, the most vulnerable. Um, I think this year, actually, people have come to understand it's not like that at all. Um, mm. We're actually in the same boat. Interestingly, there's been some uh, great research published three years ago in which um, the scientists looked at what happens to crop yields when these extreme events happen. What happens when there's a big drought? What happens when there's a huge flood? And you know what they found? They found that of course, temporarily, the crop yields declined, but they declined worse in the global north than the global south. So um, it's only a few years away. I mean, I must point out that food, food production is going well still. We've still got lots of reserves, but it's only a few years away that we're going to come to the point where world food production is going to go into decline. We, we can't wait until then. It has to be now. It has to be this year. Mm. And our problem is not sea level rise. No. Our problem is food security. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'll say again, I think that there's a problem which is just completely unforeseen in the report and by, maybe in general. And that is people read these things and they think that it's a linear problem and it's not linear, it's nonlinear. The report, every time it comes out, is too conservative and then you have to correct it again. 
they, they consistently get that wrong. And one reason they get it wrong is because of the interactivity between these things. And that's just not being monitored at all, I don't think. So, um, so to, to somehow raise that flag and say, look, forget this concept, whatever you had of, of 2050 or 20, the next century after this, we're, we're looking at these things that are mounting uh, one after the other and co cooperative, they're becoming synergistic in a way which was completely unforeseen over and over again in such quick fashion that we can't keep track of it. That's and that, right. is, that is a sign of, of crisis beyond our understanding, mm. yeah. our ability to predict. But we know one thing. We know from observations that's in this working group and report, all of the climate change indicators are accelerating. All of the most severe impacts, so-called severe weather events, they're accelerating. That's right. a matter of fact. It's documented yep. by the graphs in the report. Yep. Well, what do we say? We'll have to say it in some fresh new way. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yes. Okay. I think it's a really wonderful ending to this very, very dark and difficult subject. I want to thank both of you, Brian, Brian Wright and Peter, Peter Carter. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm Mark Anderson, and I, I'm uh, honored to be with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark.